Welcome to SAIS. Uh, my name's Dana Allen. I'm a professorial lecturer here in uh, European and Eurasian Studies. Uh, I should say a visiting professorial lecturer. Um, I um, I'm somewhat embarrassed to keep repeating the whole sponsorship structure of this, but I'm slightly less embarrassed because I really have a, I mean, there are a lot of faces in here, and they're almost all new faces, so um, we, we have sort of a revolving um, um, lectureship listener base or something. But anyway, what I wanted to say is that my day job is at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London where I'm a senior fellow and um, editor of Survival. And this series of talks is co-sponsored by uh, SAIS European and Eurasian Studies and, and the IISS. And I'm featuring, uh, for the most part, uh, contributors to my journal, um, uh, to the I'm journal, for you. Of, of which a copy is, has been conveniently supplied, Survival, Global Politics and Strategy, Sam Sh Samuel Sherup, is the uh, senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia at the IISS, at, based here in, in our office in Washington. Uh, he has had a career, um, a short career, well not short, but he's, uh, he's a young man. He was a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs fellow at the State Department, he, where he served as a senior advisor uh, to the Acting Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. That's Rose Gottemuller, is that right? Yep. Um, and he was on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff. He continues to advise the department as a, um, as a consultant. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, Sam was director for Russia and Eurasia at the Center for American Progress. Um, and uh, he has had various other consulting positions. He's I'm looking for your education. I know you got your you got a BA from Amherst and his PhD or his DPhil, I should say, from Oxford in uh, Russian and Eurasian studies. And as I say, he's a uh, he's been with us, I think, for a year or two. two years, two years. But in that time, he's been a very prolific contributor to uh, many publications, including Survival. Uh, recent uh, articles include Ukraine seeking an elusive new normal beyond the Russian, or that was the national interest, but Russia, the West, and the integration dilemma. He had an, another recent piece, was it in there? Um, called the Ukraine Impasse? The, called the Ukraine Impasse. Uh, and his title tonight is quite ambitious, uh, or maybe not, maybe it's not a problem. How to Avoid a New Cold War. Sam. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, thanks for the opportunity here tonight, and thank you all for coming. President Obama's uh, UN General Assembly speech um, drew attention, particularly for the parts where he addressed the threat from ISIS and an, an apparent war return to the US war footing in the Middle East. Um, but being the parochial Russia Eurasia watcher that I am, I was most struck by the passages on the Ukraine crisis. And I just want to quote the president briefly here. He said, quote, America and our allies will support the people of Ukraine as they develop their democracy and economy. We will reinforce our NATO allies and uphold our commitment to collective defense. We will impose a cost on Russia for aggression and counter falsehoods with the truth. We call upon others to join us on the right side of history, for while small gains can be won at the barrel of a gun, they will ultimately be turned back if enough voices support the freedom of nations and peoples to make their own decisions. Moreover, a different path is available, the path of diplomacy and peace, and the ideals the UN is designed to uphold. The recent ceasefire agreement in Ukraine offers an opening to achieve that objective. If Russia takes that path, then we will lift our sanctions and welcome Russia's role in addressing common challenges." End quote. Unlike the new assertiveness in the Middle East, actually this part of the speech is really not a new policy, um, but it is a crystallization of the uh, broader U.S. and Western policy that has emerged over the last six to nine months and one that was made in very pointed terms. And I think it underscores um, that the current course that, uh, that President Obama outlined is, um, to be diplomatic, suboptimal. Um, so while it's clear that the tragedies and outrages of the Ukraine crisis have demanded a response from Western policymakers, 
Um, the need for a response does not imply that any response will do. Um, the response thus far, as you heard from Obama, um, has focused on first, uh, some have said punishing, in this case assessing costs to Russia and its leaders for their transgressions of international law, second on, trans on supporting Ukraine, and third reassuring NATO allies. Now all that, in my view, um, was necessary, um, but it's not sufficient um, because it doesn't address any of the problems that led to this impasse. Um, and so a number of issues, and I'm going to talk about four of them, led my, uh, my co-author and I, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, uh, Jeremy Shapiro of the Brookings Institution, uh, to author the piece that is the same title of this, uh, uh, as this talk does in the current issue of uh, another journal, Not Half as Good as Survival, um, called, not a bad one. <laughs> called Current History, under the same title. Um, and I think we were frustrated by four aspects of, of, the, of the current approach. First um, is a uh, failure to acknowledge uh, the choice that I think we're now facing. And I think that choice is pretty stark. Uh, on the one hand, um, a protracted period of confrontation with Russia that could be exceptionally costly and dangerous, and for which leaders are not preparing their publics. And on the other hand, the potential for an accommodation that might avoid that confrontation. The second frustration, I think, was that uh, certain lessons learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union seemed to be deeply flawed. You often hear implicit analogies to the Soviet collapse in the context of this crisis, that we're sort of going to have a repeat of that phenomenon, where after decades of um, sort of proxy battles and Cold War, the West will once again emerge victorious. Um, Specifically, the U.S. non-recognition of the uh, Soviet annexation of the Baltic states is often cited as, as, as an as a analogy to the way in which, the, in this case, the U.S. won't and the West won't recognize Russia's annexation of Crimea. The problem is that the U.S. policy of non-recognition of the Baltic states, while morally justified, uh, non-recognition of annexation, Soviet annexation of the Baltic states, played, um, was morally justified but played no role in the event that allowed them to regain their independence, namely the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that event was largely a function of internal dynamics, most importantly the inability of the command economic system to reform without imploding, and the subversive institutions that they've been called on the republic level of the USSR that allowed Republican elites to mobilize nationalism in order to pull away from the Soviet center. Those are very unique circumstances and exceptionally unlikely to repeat themselves. Moreover, NATO's standing on the right side of history, to borrow from the president, uh, didn't create those circumstances. Um, they were deeply of an internal origin. And so most of the time when we've attempted to or desired that, uh, attempted to change or desired that uh, they change, that namely regimes we find objectionable, without violently overthrowing them, we failed. And the examples of Iran, North Korea, Cuba come to mind in this context. In other words, sitting behind our sort of well-fortified NATO wall uh, and waiting for Russia to implode isn't really a strategy that strikes me as um, uh, appropriate for the circumstances. I think the third frustration that led us to write this piece is with the devaluing of the role of negotiations and diplomacy, in particularly the U.S. approach to the crisis. Now, I should say the Russians bear much of the blame here, the lying, particularly public lying and private lying, and uh, perceived public backstabbing, particularly after the Geneva meeting in April, um, and these apparently pointless phone calls between Putin and Obama. Uh, have contributed to a deep uh, frustration among um, the principals in this government here uh, with their Russian counterparts. And I think the, uh, it's further complicated by the fact that the primary interlocutor for um, foreigners in dealing with Russians in this crisis, the foreign minister, um, does not appear to be running the show, uh, and i.e. to have the authority to affect policy on this crisis uh, in, in Moscow. So the administration's frustration and lack of interest in, in negotiation and talks is understandable. But it's not an adequate excuse, uh, I think, to avoid 
them completely. Because any improvements in, in the situation, be it on the ground in Ukraine or in the international system more broadly, will only come through the give and take of direct talks. If you look at the two agreements reached last month in Minsk on the ceasefire and then implementing measures, you'll find two examples. But you'll also notice that the US is not involved in the trilateral contact group. In fact, since Geneva in April, the US hasn't been involved in most contacts with Moscow on the crisis, be it the interventions by phone um, by Merkel and Hollande in late June during the first ceasefire when it was about to collapse, or the meetings uh, hosted by the uh, German foreign minister in Berlin in August. We should not expect to achieve our, our goals um, or for policy change to occur in other countries by osmosis, um, that Russia will, as a result of feeling the pain from our sanctions, decide independently of a negotiating process that it should take our advice and completely change its policy. Um, and the fourth and final frustration that led us to write, write this piece, I think, is, is about strategy. Um, and in the piece, we argue that the, uh, a broader strategy on the crisis must start with a debate about how we got to where we are, how the relationship between Russia and the West in the post-Cold War period unraveled and unraveled so quickly and so dramatically. And um, on that debate sort of does exist now, but it's been remarkably shallow and polarized. On the one hand, there are those like John Mearsheimer, the University of Chicago political scientist who wrote in the recent issue of a, some other foreign affairs journal, um, not nearly as good as survival, uh, who blamed the crisis uh, on an, uh, squarely on the West and on enlargement of Euro-Atlantic institutions, uh, saying that it was Western encroachment precipitating um, Russia's moves this uh, winter and spring. And the solution for them is to provide guarantees that enlargement will cease. And on the other hand, poll, there are those who believe that uh, enlargement was an absolute good. It cemented democratic gains in post-communist Europe and protected vulnerable states from Russian aggression. And the solution for them is to quickly grant institutional membership in some form or another, if not membership, then deeper institutional integration to Ukraine, Georgia, and any other interested Russian neighbor. Both of these polls, uh, I believe, miss the fundamental issue which we need to start a strategy with, namely whether Russia can ever, under any circumstances, be a normal partner for the West. If one believes, or one has concluded, that the last 20 years demonstrate that Russia is innately hostile to the West and its values, and therefore will never accept genuine partnership in, on terms we could accept, then Western-Russian conflict is inevitable. Uh, and therefore, aggressive efforts to contain or confront Russia um, in light of the current crisis are both necessary and worth any downside they might entail. In other words, we need to prepare our militaries and societies for a protracted period of conflict in Europe. Um, by contrast, if one reads the history of the post-Cold War relationship in a more tragic light as a series of miscalculations, particularly about the compatibility of continued institutional enlargement, with a cooperative security relationship between Russia and the West, then there's a need to find a balance between sanctioning Russia for its recent transgressions and keeping the door open for better relations in the future. In thinking about this dispute, or uh, those perhaps two reads on Russia in, the, in its post-Cold War incarnation, it does echo a key debate about the Soviet Union in, in early Cold War historiography, um, namely whether the Cold War began because of fundamental contradictions between the West and the Soviet Union, or due to a series of misunderstandings and miscalculations on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Um, but even those historians who favor the sort of miscalculation explanation do not deny that the fundamental contradictions existed between the West and the Soviet Union. It's pretty hard to deny them. The Soviet Union was an expansionist ideological power with global ambitions and deep hostility to Western interests. Um, Post-Soviet Russia is certainly unpleasant in a lot of ways and has transgressed uh, a number of key international norms in the past year, but it is not the Soviet Union. Um, in other words, despite the, th that similarity between those two debates, actually the debate itself um, indicates the key difference between these two historical periods, that today fundamental incompatibilities cannot account for the current conflict that we see between Russia and the West. Evidence for that um, can be seen in how unexpected the confrontation uh, in this year, in 2014, was for all parties involved. 
Um, in the piece we quote, and I think it's worth uh, quoting for you here, um, the June 2013, so this is just over a year ago, um, the joint U.S.-Russian statement issued by the presidents of both countries on enhanced bilateral engagement, quote, the United States of America and the Russian Federation reaffirm their readiness to intensify bilateral cooperation based on the principles of mutual respect, equality, and genuine respect for each other's interests. That was uh, at the G8 summit, I believe, in Loch Ern, the last one that Russia attended. Um, nine months later, of course, Obama would introduce uh, unprecedented sanctions on Russia for its actions in Ukraine. And so while the current conflict might, uh, was not inevitable, in the months and years leading up to the February 2014 invasion of Crimea, the Euro-Atlantic institutional architecture had become an increasing source of friction between Russia and the West. It should go without saying that, that, uh, that the institutional enlargement path that was embarked upon in the mid-1990s has transformed much of post-communist Europe for the better, an outcome that was far from inevitable in the early 1990s, and as the Arab Spring demonstrates, unique in its success. But it is equally clear that this path had an inherent flaw from the start, primarily in how it dealt with Russia and its neighbors. The basic premise of NATO and EU enlargement was that the rules were not negotiable. Aspiring members uh, adopted the existing rules, or what the e EU calls the acquis communautaire, in order to join the club. NATO and EU officials in, in those countries were given free reign to roam the halls of their former enemies in the Warsaw Pact and impose um, Brussels rules and recreate structures in its likeness. But the inherent flaw to that decision, namely to uh, extend the institutional status quo in Western Europe to Eastern and Central Europe, was that NATO and the EU could never fully integrate Russia in this way, largely because Russia would never accept integration on non-negotiable terms. An alternative to an extension of the status quo in Western Europe, I mean the status quo that existed in the early 90s, which would have been a wholesale revi revision of the institutional order so that Russia could be comfortably accommodated within it, would have been a huge risk. So it's understandable why, why policymakers decided against it um, at, that, at that period. Um, moreover, Russia was, until quite recently, so weakened by its own post-communist transformation that it could not block the process and demonstrated no will to do so. But ever since taking that initial decision to enlarge in the way that, uh, that, that decided to enlarge, the West has done its best to manage the consequences of that inherent initial flaw. And what emerged was a balancing act that can be called partnership without membership. Um, and it's also true, by the way, that that inherent flaw wasn't discovered, so to speak, until the mid-2000s, uh, uh, particularly in the, in the period of increased cooperation uh, in the early years of the Putin presidency, believe it or not, following 9-11. Um, NATO and EU cooperation with Russia was arguably more substantive than cooperation with Russia's neighbors. And Putin of that period used rhetoric that might shock us if Putin were to use it today. Speaking to the BBC in March 2000, he said, quote, Russia is a part of European culture. I simply cannot see my country isolated from Europe, from what we often describe as the civilized world. That is why it is hard for me to regard NATO as an enemy. We believe that it is possible to speak even about higher levels of integration with NATO. Asked if Russia could join NATO, Putin responded, why not? But once the impossibility of Russian membership became obvious and Western integration with Russia's neighbors accelerated, the relationship between Russia and the West began to unravel. And despite all the successful cooperation that some folks in this room had a hand in, uh, on issues from Afghanistan to nonproliferation to counterterrorism, um, Moscow still viewed Euro-Atlantic integration for Russia's neighbors as a strategic threat. To Russia, uh, this threat perception has always seemed somewhat uncontroversial, and our uh, befuddlement with it as somewhat uh, strange. Its neighbors were being incorporated into political and economic, uh, political, economic and security blocks of which it could never be a part. So the West interpreted Moscow's policy as denying its neighbors the right to make their own choices on foreign and security policy, which brought back bad memories of the Soviet Union's attitude toward Warsaw Pact countries. 
And this today remains the fundamental chasm, a regional integration agenda which, while not intended as an anti-Russian effort by, those, by its authors or the states that aspire to it, Russia cannot and does not desire to join. The Ukraine crisis um, began in, in, this, in the context of this contest for influence in what used to be called Europe and Russia's common neighborhood. Uh, and after obfuscating the question of his motives with claims of genocide against Russian speakers and a number of other things uh, in the early weeks after, after Crimea, Putin has actually been quite open about his motives um, for the invasion and subsequent destabilization of eastern Ukraine. Speaking on uh, May 24th, 2014, he said, quote, uh, some of the recent events in Ukraine directly threaten our interests. First of all, with regard to security, I'm talking about Ukraine's potential accession to NATO. As I said earlier, such an accession could be followed by the deployment of missile strike systems in Ukraine, including Crimea. Should this happen, it would have serious geopolitical consequences for our country. In fact, Russia would be forced out of the Black Sea region, an area that it fought for a legitimate presence um, for centuries." End quote. The tragedy in Ukraine that has unfolded in recent months notwithstanding, the key question for European security today is what to do about this relationship with Russia, or as the title of my talk suggests, how to avoid a new Cold War. Clearly, the crisis itself has relegated the partnership without membership model to the dustbin of history. Um, as, I've just, as I described in, in earlier, the Western response to the crisis, which had this three-pronged approach, sanction and isolate Russia, assist and deepen integration with the new Ukrainian government and Russia's other vulnerable neighbors, and reassure Central and Eastern European NATO members, effectively doubles down on the institutional enlargement policy, reinforcing previous gains and expanding the institutions reach farther east. It is clear that Russia will see these efforts not as a response to its actions in Ukraine, but as an opportunistic continuation of the same post-Cold War policy that it has long decried as a threat to its security. And a newly assertive Russia is likely to continue to push back against enlargement, and this action and reaction dynamic will accelerate. Under these circumstances, providing new security guarantees or EU integration to ever more vulnerable states on Russia's borders raises the stakes, uh, raises the risk of a direct con conflict with Moscow. And Russia has made it clear that it views keeping Euro-Atlantic institutions out of its neighborhood as a vital interest, while Europe and the US do not view the security of Russia's neighbors as fundamental to their interests. During the Cold War, many questioned whether the United States would sacrifice New York to defend Berlin. Today, it would be hard to argue, or you wouldn't be able to convince many, that NATO would do the same for Kiev. In the event, the alliance would face a choice between transgressing heretofore sacrosanct security guarantees or risking war with a major nuclear power. We need to ask ourselves whether the principles that are at stake, the right of every country to make its own foreign policy choices and freely choose its alliances, are worth either of those outcomes. The same question has been asked, it should be noted, regarding previous rounds of institutional enlargement. The difference today is that Russia has demonstrated its willingness to act. In other words, there, this is no longer a rhetorical question. Avoiding the unpalatable choice it poses will require recognizing that the post-Cold War policy of institutional enlargement, despite its successes, has run its course. Indeed, the West's continuing insistence that the only path to stability and security in Europe is for Russia's neighbors to be absorbed into Euro-Atlantic institutions is now begetting threats to stability and security in Europe. But acknowledging that fact does not mean that the West must accept Russian domination of its sovereign neighbors. Indeed, instead, that is, uh, new arrangements are needed for non-NATO Europe that are acceptable to them, the West, and Russia. Achieving a deal on what those arrangements might look like is uh, possible, I'll argue, um, but it will require both sides to compromise. Um, the West would have to accept that the model that works so well in Central and Eastern Europe will not work for the rest of the continent. Institutional arrangements will have to be acceptable to all parties, including Russia, in order for them to succeed. And Russia would have to strictly adhere to, to the limits that such new arrangements would impose on its influence in the region and to forswear military intervention in the affairs of its neighbors. Achieving such a bargain in the current 
atmosphere of mistrust and mutual recrimination will be extremely difficult. But it's not impossible, and at least the first step uh, is, at least from uh, the U.S. and broader Western side, is to adopt a compromise along those lines as its long-term <coughs> goal, rather than seeking to seize the rhetorical high ground or punish Russia, etc. Um, the policy response to the crisis could then be structured around achieving that long-term goal. This does not mean, of course, that the West should simply accommodate Russian demands. This is not a polar choice between either coercion or negotiation. The, pros, the proposed bargain requires Russia to make difficult compromises too. And negotiations will likely, therefore, to have to be combined with elements of coercion in order to succeed. Um, such a strategy would offer a path, uh, Russia a path towards security in its neighborhood without confrontation with the West, but it would, it would also entail isolation and confrontation if Russia refuses to engage on the new bargain. In practical terms, what that means is that sanctions must be accompanied by an offer for negotiation on the European security order and its future. Of course, such an offer, such interest in talks um, is not new in terms of from the Russian side at least. In 2009, then Russian President Dmitry Medvedev proposed actually a quite similar negotiation when put, and he put forth a draft European security treaty. The document itself was certainly deeply flawed, um, but it indicated both a deep dissatisfaction with the institutional status quo in Europe and a desire to negotiate a new order for European security, not a desire exclusively to create disorder. The dismissive Western response to that proposal, of course, stemmed from the concern that it was intended to undermine NATO and the EU. Even the relative Russia-friendly German uh, Foreign Minister Frank-Walter Steinmeier, who was Foreign Minister at the time of the proposal and now Foreign Minister again, um, felt the need to emphasize in response uh, that any discussion of European security could not challenge existing institutions. He said, quote, to avoid any possible ambiguity, the EU, NATO, and the OSCE remain the cornerstones of European security. What has taken us decades to build up is not for discussion. It, sorry, what has taken us decades to build is not up for discussion. But of course, it was precisely those cornerstones that Russia wanted to discuss. Um, this time, both sides would need to demonstrate a willingness to enter into negotiations without such taboos or preconditions. The key to success in the short term, I would argue, is finding harmonizing mechanisms between the Euro-Atlantic institutions and the Russia-led institutions like the CSTO and the Eurasian Economic Union for current non-members. The West would have to part with the take via key or leave it approach. Um, and uh, Russia would also have to compromise in terms of accepting that all these countries might not actually be members of these institutions. As we've seen in recent weeks, the EU-Ukraine-Russia talks on Ukraine's association agreement and uh, future economic integration with its neighbors indicate that it's possible to discuss these issues in an inclusive manner without the sky falling. Um, but this is a po policy of necessity. It's not an ideal policy. It's not a policy that, we, that the West would choose if it had a choice. Uh, and therefore, it's difficult for any statesman to embrace publicly. And it's abhorrent to many to even contemplate compromising the principles of enlargement uh, that contributed to the successful transitions in Central and Eastern Europe. But the alternative, I'm afraid, is a confrontation with Russia that the West does not want in order to uphold principles that it will ultimately not be willing to defend. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sam, thank you uh, very much. I just want to, uh, let me start off, um, and it may be that I didn't fall, I mean, you, you came to a kind of a rousing crescendo <laughs> with, I think, some important points, but uh, just to clarify them. The, the, the principles of enlargement can mean two things, it seems to me. One is, um, and let's talk about NATO for a minute. One is NATO's, you know, the sanctity of NATO's Article 5 guarantee um, to countries that are already members NATO, of NATO. Now, these include countries that maybe we shouldn't have brought into NATO. I mean, you know, I'm not arguing mm -hmm. that. Uh, but they're in now. Um, 
So, uh, you know, the other principle of enlargement is the idea that it can go on forever and Russia has no right to say anything about it. Now, I, when you say this really need, all these principles need to be open to negotiation, um, you know, what Stein, Steinmeier was saying, I think, is that, well, I don't know what he was saying, but one thing he could have been saying is that, you know, the Article 5 guarantee cannot be, I mean, the, you know, the basic security of NATO members as they exist right now can't be reopened um, in, in yep. any of these negotiations. I, I guess this is just a complicated way of saying, you know, don't we have to, yeah. don't we have to accept that there are borderlands yeah. and um, that's what the negotiation is going to be about? Um, well, I wouldn't use that term, but uh, yes, so I'm not suggesting that uh, any of the principles of enlargement that have already been applied to existing members of your Atlantic institutions be mitigated in any way. We're talking about the principle of that guided enlargement in, right, in the okay. sense I just of, wanted to, yeah, yeah. beyond current members. So okay, but then that becomes a slightly diminished negotiation. It's about countries like Ukraine and Georgia. Which is the locus of the, of okay. the current conflict, I would okay. argue. Um, and it will ultimately include a guarantee that they're not going to be part of NATO, and or, or even the EU. So um, guarantees are tricky things. Yeah. Um, in 2008, uh, NATO more or less guaranteed that <coughs> Ukraine and Georgia will be members. Will be I know, members. I know. So that's my. Um, I think uh, we're. And given the current state of relations among the actors involved, it seems highly unlikely that such guarantees could even be credible, even if they were made. Um, so I think we're talking about uh, more of a focus less on what we're not going to do and, and potential bridging mechanisms that we actually could implement that would alleviate the current binary choice faced by countries that are currently not members of either the Russia okay, institutions so or the Euro Atlantic ones. I think. Good. Um, who's gonna catch my eye first with a question or comment? You sir. Hi. Uh, please identify yourself by the way if you if you don't of course. Uh, my name is Luke Toma. I'm a, a student at an American University. I'm uh, just a freshman there actually this year. My question is in terms of bringing uh, people like Vladimir Putin to the negotiating table, who have adopted such a policy of uh, caution, to put it diplomatically, when it comes to the West, what kind of things would need to be done to alleviate the fears that Putin brings to the table about negotiating with the Western world due to what he's seen the West do in terms of bringing NATO to his borders, particularly after the Cold War ended. Like, what would we need to be done to even alleviate some of Russia's fears and Putin's fears specifically? Does that make sense as a question? I think it does. Um, I think it, it, you're assuming that Russia's afraid of negotiations. Um, I'm not so sure. And I don't think we've really tested uh, that proposition to know whether uh, the offer in itself wouldn't be taken up. Uh, and and it, even if they come to the negotiating table, even if they negotiate, and you, you you mentioned this plan that would need to be compromised with Russia. But in the past year, two year period, would they be interested in anything but what they've demanded, which simply is NATO uh, holding back from going into Ukraine? Like, what kind of compromise would the Russians be willing to accept in Europe? So when, when it comes to Ukraine, actually, I think, you know, one, one could argue that at, at great human and uh, economic cost, um, they might have just achieved their objectives and might not no longer be interested in such a negotiation. But that is not in uh, U.S. interest to allow to, you know, perpetuate in, in the sense that it will have, that Putin will have gotten his no NATO guarantee by, you know, de facto creating a protracted conflict in the, in the east of the country, which isn't good for anybody, Russia included. Um, so th we're talking about means of trying to avoid those kinds of worst case outcomes. Um, but the, the point of a negotiation, and if you look at some of the, the classical negotiations, even the ones that happened towards the end of the Cold War, is that not all of the parties went in knowing what they would get when it ended, four plus two, negotiations being a, a good example, um, that there's a principle here 
whereby you know you empower uh, negotiators to actually have a, a bit of back and forth and give and take, um, and it might take a long time, uh, and they might not you know reach ground earth-shattering agreements tomorrow, but. Uh, you know, the process it itself actually is Im uh, important in that context. Thank you. you had a question, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Will Stacher, and I'm a research assistant with the Plowshares Fund. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you for a very, uh, very nice and comprehensive lecture. Um, but going back to the very beginning, um, when you were talking about uh, Obama's UNGA speech, um, so in specific reference to uh, lifting the sanctions that are in place now. Uh, Angela Merkel has recently said that um, we're nowhere near lifting the sanctions. Russians are talking about that now because you know, the country's been frozen in place. Um, I'm just wondering, in your mind, um, what would kind of these conditions be um, that would satisfy EU and US leaders um, to begin lifting the sanctions, if that is even possible? So, um Senior officials on background phone calls from journal to, with journalists have uh, identified themselves as senior officials. Have um, in fact gotten much more specific than uh, than I can be off the cuff here. I was about to pull out that quote that I have, I think, handy somewhere here. But um, bottom line is that they have laid out a number of conditions, uh, most of which are in the two Minsk documents. Um, and uh, but it is unclear to me. I mean, it goes. I think the it, well, we'll see what happens if, if and when Russia meets all those conditions. Uh, there are other factors I think that uh, that come into play here as well. And there is a risk that in the U.S. case, many of these sanctions will could soon be legislated, which will tie the hand of the executive branch in a way that uh, so far we haven't seen. Michael, Michael Kimmich, Catholic University. I want to ask you <coughs> about relative strength and weakness, and it seems to be one possible reading of your argument that uh, in the 1990s when the U.S. was establishing its post-Cold War relationship with Russia, <coughs> Russia was economically and in other ways very, very weak. That's no longer the case. And to what degree is that the story of the situation that Russia has sort of come into its own uh, and... Uh, you know, NATO has always been perceived as something of a threat, but now is a threat that they're no longer uh, going to tolerate as a possibility in Ukraine, and that there sort of a, is a greater degree of aggressiveness now because Russia sees itself as stronger. Whether it sees the West as weaker, I'm not quite so sure. But to what degree is uh, uh, a kind of alternating relationship of strength and weakness uh, the story of a situation? So uh, um, I wouldn't. Uh, and, I don't think structural realism in this context could really explain everything. I mean, we were, in the 1990s, the idea that Ukraine could be an aspirant NATO member was would have been la you'd have been laughed out of the room. Um, so I think the uh, the circumstances of institutional enlargement changed dramatically um, in subsequent years, and that. Um, so it's hard to play it kind of factual, like if that weren't the case and Russia were in the economic straits that it were in, was in in the 1990s, would a NATO enlargement drive back then have had the same, have produced the same response? Hard to say. Now, we should also keep in mind that throughout the 1990s, the idea of Russia having some significantly strengthened relationship with NATO, if not to include membership, was also not laughed out of the room. <laughs> um, uh, or if it was left out of the room, it was in the same breath as the idea of Ukrainian NATO membership. Um, so we, we really did enter a new European security reality with uh, particularly the, um, what do they refer to it as, the Big Bang or the uh, 2004 enlargement was the, the some term. I don't really, I remember. Was, to was that. it called the Big Bang? Um, I can't remember. Yeah. In any case, uh, so it's hard to say. I mean, um, and I think that other factors besides strength and weakness were the key drivers. Now, there are enablers, of course, now. Um, but just to get to this uh, broader question of um, economic strength and weakness, you know, there are many who would uh, respond to this question by rattling off the cumulative GDP of, um, you know, all the countries that have uh, joined in sanctioning Russia with Russia's and it's like you know 2.3 trillion in Russia to something like 40 and you know, but 
I'm not so sure that holds up because Russia's ambitions aren't to defeat the <laughs> the, the West more broadly, um, and uh, you know therefore there can it's not about a uh, head-on confrontation where all that 40 trillion is aimed at all that 2.3. Um, so because even today, relatively to one another, there is a strength and weakness differential on on economic on the economic side for sure. Um, less so on the military side in Europe, um, not head to head with the United States, of course, but the U.S. doesn't have all of its assets parked um, in Europe. Yes. Uh, an excellent of Duke Ambush in Ukraine. Let me add Ukrainian voice in this discussion. Um, I, 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 I wanted to ask you simply how to avoid a new Cold War again to repeat the situation. But um, I would like to say some, uh, some things. First of all, I cannot agree with you that uh, Ukraine received any kind of security guarantees in 2008. I didn't say that. Bucharest summit, uh, NATO Bucharest summit, it was total failure of the West. No, but there was a declaration that yeah, NATO, Ukraine would be part of NATO. Uh, That's all he was we saying. Remember that, that it was the case of uh, granting a membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia. And we know that some European capitals uh, agreed with Russia uh, to, um, to give negative you know, answer on a Ukrainian and Georgian request. Uh, it's a very important event uh, in the European history because this crisis began in 2008. When the West simply um, Bergen or sold Ukraine or Ukrainian interests, uh, avoiding many kind, avoiding may, maybe any kind of confrontation with Russia. Uh, it's very important to recognize that failure to grant uh, Ukraine and uh, Georgia a, a map. Uh, it was the beginning of uh, crucial changes in uh, Russian foreign policy. Even in other parts of the uh, Eurasian um, area, it, uh, it gave additional impetus to Russian uh, aggressive uh, integration efforts on the Eurasian area. The second, my second point that uh, we, and we remember what, what happened in 2008 uh, in Georgia. Uh, my second point that uh, if we talk about possible status quo between Ukraine or between the West and Russia, uh, we have to remember that today we have um, a new protracted frozen conflict. Uh, I, I will say um, frozen conflict area with their uh, drone line, I mean Eastern Ukraine. Uh, nobody knows how to resolve the situation. We can expect that it could be a new Transnistria or South Ossetia or new frozen conflict in the post-Soviet area. Uh, and uh, we have to remember about Crimea and what kind of solution could be in the negotiations between the West and Russia. Uh, oh, uh, could we imagine the negotiation between the West and Russia without Ukraine in this case? I don't know. Maybe not. But uh, uh, Crimea uh, and the Eastern Ukraine today is the two questions uh, which uh, pose, pose very difficult challenge for any, any model of uh, final agreement. And how do you see uh, the way to find the solution for Eastern Ukraine and Crimea in this situation? Got it. So, Bucharest Declaration. Um, frankly, it was the worst of both worlds in that not only did it not grant uh, the summit, that is, um, the membership action plan, but it also produced the declaration itself, which, and I quote, will become. So you could say that, uh, that, the, um, that the failure to grant MAP produced the kinds of uh, foreign policy changes that you're describing, or you, perhaps you could say the declaration did. I don't know. They were coterminous. Um, so uh, on that question, um, that's how I'd respond. On this, um, the, how do you deal with eastern Ukraine and Crimea in the context of the negotiation that I'm talking about? Clearly, 
the objective uh, that I would suggest to any U.S. or European policymaker going into that is to find some means of getting them back to Ukraine. But I don't think that's going to happen through any other means than negotiation. Um, in other words, I don't see a coercive uh, strategy for their return, unless you think that Russia is going to collapse like the Soviet Union, about which I expressed my doubts in the beginning. Um, clearly, any institutional arrangements that emerge will have to be acceptable to not only the West and Russia, but also Ukraine and others of Russia's neighbors. Broadly speaking, um, in light of the new uh, interim uh, gas deal uh, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, how um, how dependent uh, do you see uh, Ukraine uh, uh, on uh, Russia to help facilitate that? Because I know the U.S. and Canada has, have, have pledged that they would help uh, supply gas in light of the deal does not go through. Um, I don't think they've pledged to supply gas. I think the, the U.S. has pledged to supply expertise in, in helping Ukraine with this problem. The United States doesn't have the capacity in the short term to export LNG, period, until 2017. Um, uh, the initial volumes, of course, are all contracted for markets in Asia, where the prices are higher than in Europe. And Ukraine doesn't have LNG import facilities. So I don't know exactly how overseas gas would help in this context. Um, I would uh, suggest you have a look at the video and potential future article of my colleague um, Pierre Noel, who knows far more about the energy side of these questions than I do. He's the double out of less senior fellow for um, energy security. Uh, and his latest work is on this question of uh, the winter in Ukraine and whether or not um, we will see another uh, crisis, a European gas crisis this winter. His conclusions are pretty bleak, um, but uh, I'll let you read or watch him make them. www.iiss.org <laughs> is where you'll find that. Uh, sir. Uh, Stanley Kober, double uh, double S number. There's an implicit assumption here um, that NATO deters. What is that assumption based on? We had something. Uh, I would call it NATO expansion before. Um, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. It was supposed to bring the same sort of stability to Southeast Asia. It didn't deter. We had the Vietnam War. We lost. CETO doesn't exist anymore. Our armed forces are now much smaller than they were then, and they continue to shrink. European defense budgets are going down. And look at the success of the American military in Iraq, in Libya. In Iraq, I'm just looking at a story. Um, so far, most of the attention has been on Kobani and what the Islamic State is doing there. But they apparently are approaching Baghdad, and the Baghdad airport may be in range of their artillery. In which case, how do we evacuate our people from Baghdad? Are we exaggerating our own military power? in making these promises. So, um, I think we know for sure that Russia sees a difference between NATO Europe and non-NATO Europe. And I think the best uh, sign that there is some deterrent effect is the different way in which um, the extent to which Russia would go, the lengths, to avoid, as it saw, the potential for Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. So I don't know if that's a deterrent effect in the, in the, in the purely <laughs> military sense that you're uh, asking about. But also on this question of U.S. military strength, um, you know, the, the very failed operations from apparently your perspective that you're, that you're describing are the ones that drove the Russian military to modernize um, because they were seen as uh, such a new uh, successful way of war and that from the Russian military's perspective, the U.S. military is the gold standard. Um, so if you have concerns about the uh, um, 
you know. I think you may be misunderstanding okay. the question Go a ahead. little bit. We're focused on the traditional Russia Ukraine threat end of the Cold War, but there is now this other threat which is going to consume our attention. What's going to be left? Oh, I see. And doesn't that also threaten, I would say, even the survivability of NATO? We now have a NATO member, Turkey, that is under direct, now direct threat. That is Article 5. How much can NATO do, given declining defense budgets? How much can it do? How much, can we, how much should we promise? Well, are you asked, sorry, I, I still don't get your question. Are you asking whether, your point is that we shouldn't extend new promises? Or that One you lesson doubt I that learned from Vietnam, you don't do people a favor by losing a war in their behalf. Don't make promises you can't keep. Okay, but that's a different question to the question of whether our guarantees to Poland have a deterrent value vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I don't think that, Poland, that Russia really has much interest. Okay, in Poland, right. well that's always a problem, an yeah. analytical problem, I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry, go I'm, ahead. I don't know that I have anything to add. Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, a fair point, you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ken Meyer, uh, <coughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm a little uh, surprised by your statement about uh, one of our principles being allowing countries to make their own decisions, set their own policy, and whatnot. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of how the current government of Ukraine came into being uh, when a, the duly elected president of the country uh, wanted to make a deal with Russia that we did not approve of. And uh, according to Victoria, uh, half section of the EU Newland, we had uh, spent $5 billion prior to the coup in Ukraine to influence events in that country. Um, so I, I, I wonder how you reconcile that with your, your notion that it's the Russians who, who don't allow countries to uh, uh, set their own policies. Um. <laughs> Uh, I do not see the U.S. as having been instrumental in the events that led to the overthrow of Yanukovych by any means. I think uh, Assistant Secretary Newland was referring to the entire quantity of assistance given to Ukraine over the course of the post-Soviet period from 1991 to the present, um, and not the recent months right before the events of uh, late February. And the telephone call between Ms. Newland and uh, our ambassador to Ukraine? The, we can have desires about uh, outcomes in other countries. Uh, f that that's not illegitimate. Uh, the question is whether you're. Uh, in this case, I wasn't actually. By the way, I was more uh, when I talked about this notion that of denying uh, others the choice. That is what Russia is, as I argued, perceived to be doing. Um, now. That phone call doesn't indicate we'll take out the Ukrainian government if they decide to, I don't know, join the customs union. Um, and I think there is a difference between having preferences among political leaders in another country and uh, invading when you don't like the potential foreign policy choices that they might make. Yeah, there are all sorts of levels of intervention. But do you consider the Ukrainian government legitimate? Now I do, sure. How did they come into power? Well, there's a... Okay, so we can get into a debate about the constitutionality of the removal of Yanukovych. It's not as clear-cut as you're implying. Um, the uh, Yes, it is true, the, the constitutional procedure for impeachment was not observed. However, the decision to remove him from power was passed with a constitutional majority in the RADA. So therefore, if they want to... You know, effectively, it was a change of the Constitution. Now, all that having been said... I think we should acknowledge that there were revolutionary circumstances, um, and not all revolutions are, you know, legal, so to speak, by the laws that exist in the country at the time. Including but, our own. Indeed. Uh, I think, you know, we could, uh, I think the breakup of the Soviet Union was illegal by Soviet law, too. Um, but in this case, actually, there is a... I mean, a contentious but nonetheless legal argument that, that does rest in Ukrainian law about the decision that was made. All that having been said, um, there were problems with the way in which power changed hands in late February, no question. And mostly not about the means by which they changed hands, but the, the government that came in after they did, which wasn't particularly balanced. Which makes okay, right. reaction. 
This is a debate we can um, continue over wine if, if Sam wants to. Uh, there is a reception afterwards, by the way, that, which I forgot to announce. Um, yes? Um, Crystal Marshall, I'm a first year student here at SICE. Um, in terms of the enlargement question, would the US, Russia, and Europe ever accept a situation in which um, nations such as Georgia, Ukraine, or Turkey, which are neither members of the EU or the CSTO at this point, um, allow them to remain neutral yet still participate in either trade agreements with the EU or the customs union um, or still participate in um, PFP through NATO if they so desire. So just for the record, Turkey is a member of NATO. But, uh, uh, right, but yeah. Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, Georgia. Um, so trade agreements. Uh, the United States at the moment is negotiating um, the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, two wholly different uh, groups of states involved in those two free trade agreements. And we don't have an existential crisis about um, the direction of our country and, and you know, choosing between the Pacific and the Atlantic. It's possible to have trade agreements and trade uh, relationships with a number of different entities. Now, it is impossible to be in two customs unions at the same time that have different rules. Um, but uh, so the question is, what grounds are there? What what where can you find common ground short of that? Uh, and that would be, of course, that is nominally what is supposed to be negotiated in the next fourteen months before the uh, this delay on implementation of the DCFTA, the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement between the EU and Ukraine uh, expires. As for PFP, um, you know, Russia participated in PFP for many years and uh, joined with NATO and things like um, the stabilization, what was it called? Not K4, but um, in Bosnia? Well, the original one? I don't know, but they were also in K4. They were also in K4, I forget I forget what what that's Bosnia true. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in terms of NATO's most recent primary mission besides territorial defense, namely the ISAF mission in Afghanistan, Russian cooperation with NATO was critical in, in allowing that operation to unfold. Most American servicemen who went to Afghanistan passed over Russian airspace as a result of a you know, U.S.-Russia agreement to allow them to do so. I think it was S-4, but I can't remember what that That's stands right, for. Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, I'm a former student here, and now I work at the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration. Mm. There seems to be a lot of rhetoric um, coming from both sides, at least on the working level and moving on up, about the importance of an equal partnership, like a transformed relationship between the United States and Russia, so that we can continue partnering in these areas, like nuclear security, where we both have common interests, both sides emphasizing reciprocity in the relationship, but not being able to come to a conclusion on what that looks like. Because there are hard stops for the United States, like I think you mentioned before, there's, there are things that we're willing to compromise on in making a, in establishing a partnership, and there are things that we're not willing to compromise on. And Russia might come to the table wanting an, a more equal relationship, but we're not willing to accept its prop proposals in that regard. But what would you see is a viable, reciprocal, equal relationship that could be formed with Russia? Where can we compromise and where can we not compromise? Where can Russia compromise and where can it not compromise? Let me, um, that's one aspect of the question. Let me, let me ask another one that's very familiar to you because it's what we talk about a lot. Um, and you, I mean, you and I talk about it in different panels. What about, the title of your talk is How to Avoid a New Cold War. Now, during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union cooperated diplomatically on various problems at times, at the same time they were in a conflict. You know, we have common problems and common interests with Russia, starting with, um, I mean, you know, there, there's Russia's part of the negotiating team with Iran. Um, their interests may be, not be exactly in common with ours, but they have some common interests in ours. We all hate ISIS. 
Um, how is that? How how is the other agenda going to be affected? I know, two sort of sort of separate questions. But no, I think they're actually pretty much the same. Um, so I think it's fair to say that um, every U.S. administration since the end of the Cold War um, took an approach whereby we would emphasize these areas of commonality in the relationship um, and work as much as we could on them and try to minimize the areas of disagreement or contain them somehow or, um, you know, put them in a box. Um, the problem with that is that it was sort of was a ticking time bomb and that the, those problems weren't going to stay in a box. And we never really had um, the kind of post-war settlement that, you know, often happens after a war. Uh, and despite what you hear about uh, the post-Cold War order, um, the, the one that we talk about is very different from the way that the Russians saw it. So um, I uh, have concerns and uh, fears that actually we, we have uh, exited the era of this sort of selective cooperation and selective disagreement. And we're now in a very different era where, um, as a result of decisions taken over the last nine months, increasingly it's going to become harder and harder to do business on those areas where it should be patently obvious that there's an interest in both, the, the, both countries have the interest in cooperating. ISIS is a good example, right? You know, ISIS has declared war on Russia too um, and said uh, and said some, you know, basically, you're next. Um, now, uh, you could say that our interests are allied, but that doesn't tell you anything about how two states cooperate. If there are no mechanisms for cooperation, we're just going to sort of do our own thing, potentially mutually reinforcing, potentially not. Um, it doesn't really make for the stuff of, uh, you know, international affairs. It's just sort of two countries operating in, in isolation from one another. And, you know, if you look at the P5 plus one, you're starting to see, well, one could argue that um, the recent, uh, if you believe the rumors that have come out of the talks, Iranian relative intransigence on some issues is facilitated by the fact that there are clearly cracks in the P5 plus one. And, you know, it's also hard to have a negotiation about essentially trading uh, sanctions relief for a deal on um, Iran's nuclear program when one members of the P5 plus one are sanctioning one another. Right. Um, so I think over time it's going to become that these areas, right, we've sort of for the moment, at least, not seen huge blow-ups on the P5 plus one, on New START implementation, and I imagine that will continue on serious CW removal, for example, where Russia was key in both uh, proposing it, well, not proposing it initially, but um, getting it approved uh, and implementing it. Um, you know, it, it doesn't seem to me that the, the ground for those kinds of cooperative endeavors is uh, there anymore. There's fertile, let's put it that way. And, you know, that over time caused a lot of problems because I don't think that the um, current wound that has been opened up in this relationship can be just band-aided up and we can expect uh, to have um, to everything to be like it used to be. Uh, either we're going to have some sort of broader meeting of the minds over time or it's, it's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets better. I hope I'm wrong, by the way. Yes. Hi, Augusta Ginsburg, I'm a second year here at SAIS in Strategic Studies. Uh, in light of the uh, increasing modernization efforts by the Russians of the, the nuclear arsenal, what role do you think, or how, I guess, how, how do you think uh, Putin and other parts of the Russian government view their nuclear arsenal? What, what, what do you think? As, as we're sort of beginning to let ours go by the wayside um, under a new start and sort of drawing down um, while they're spending money to, to build up, how do you think the Russians do that? Why do you think they're doing that? 
Well, I think that's actually not true in the in about what you said about the U.S. The U.S. is spending thirty trillion dollars or something over um, <laughs> billion. <laughs> trillion dollars. Yeah, not trillion. Yeah. Billion. Excuse yeah. me. So maybe um, to rephrase that. That perhaps it's 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 controversial here. We're certainly not a it's not a unified movement in the U.S. Um, do you think that well, we have a president who's committed to a world without nuclear weapons who's signed up for an extensive modernization of the U.S. U nuclear force. So, I don't know. That's as close to a consensus as you can get. It was also one of the con conditions of, uh, well, it was essentially the bargain that got New START ratified. Um, and, you know, it's a pretty dramatic ramping up of money. Now, it's also in both countries, in the case of both countries, a matter of uh, timing. We're talking about life cycles of weapons that have both, in, in both cases, sort of are reaching their end. The U.S. is slightly younger than the Russian arsenal in this case, so both countries would have had to have undertaken these efforts um, around this time. So the fact that Russia is doing it is not at all surprising. It was known before New START was happening. In a way, having New START as a way of, of keeping the um, some sort of limits on the extent of that modernization and also having um, eyes on the ground while it's happening in the form of the inspections. So, um, but you asked about the utility of the arsenal in the, in the eyes of uh, the Russian leadership. Um, I think it plays a more central role in uh, the way uh, the Russian leadership sees national security than um, it does in the way the U.S. leadership sees its own national security, Partic and that's true of both this president and the previous one, uh, and I'll explain what I mean. I think the, um, the idea of major power war and the threat of it is uh, seen as much more plausible um, in Moscow than it is here, and maybe was here before this crisis. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, with also the uh, U.S. post-Cold War military interventions in places ranging from Kosovo to Libya, the anxieties of, of those in Moscow who, uh, who are concerned about how to deter us um, are, you know, play into that. I'm tempted to ask a question about how about what you think about the plausibility of great power war. Well, why don't you? <laughs> I, just, I just did. So, um, That's such a big question. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, uh, broadly speaking, I don't think it should be keeping you up at night, Dana. There are I have things other things, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, what... <laughs> What, the, what this crisis has done, I think, is created the possibility, or increased the probability of, uh, well, not increased the probability is probably the wrong expression, has created far more opportunities for the kinds of miscalculation and uh, mistakes and brinksmanship that um, could inadvertently lead to that outcome. So that's what makes it, I think, dangerous on the global scale. Brian. Yeah. Hello, uh, Brian Fox, uh, second year uh, SICE. Um, you, when asking the question uh, how to avoid a new Cold War, you're, you're implying that a new Cold War is possible for Russia. And my question is, um, and to what extent is, this, is the threat posed by Russia something that we should be concerned about uh, in, in Europe and the West? Um, many of uh, you, considering like the um, economic and demographic decline of that Russia is facing at the moment. Many would even argue that uh, during the Cold War, our threat perception of Russia was, was too high um, from even from the 70s onwards. And in this, like, what, what threat does Russia actually pose to the West? Do you see it actually invading any, any parts of the European Union or NATO countries? Um, so the only circumstances under which I could see that happening are the result of miscalculation um, misinterpretation, uh, mistakes, uh, an escalatory spiral that is unintended at the moment. Now, um, the, the threat posed by Russia um, is mostly, I think, uh, about its periphery. However, we're not talking about a um, 
a uh, purely regional power in that its military capabilities are global. I mean, it is the only country in the world that could you know, end life on Earth as we know it in the United States. Um, and uh, that in terms of the hypothetical threat, well, I mean, that's a pretty big hypothetical threat, right? Something that we should take seriously. Could also do that in Europe, too. Um, so capabilities are, uh, you know, on a scale that you can't even really compare to China, given the size of China's nuclear arsenal. So, but you want to give a quick follow-up? Go for it. Given its kind of dependency on the West now, which it didn't have uh, when it was in the Soviet Union, because it had its own economic system of itself. Given its dependency on the West economically, how do you think that's even feasible that it would launch a nuclear strike? Well, <laughs> I'm not predicting that by any means. I'm just saying we're talking capabilities and intentions are two very different things. Um, and you know, ending life on Earth would be, that would be a mutual decision because, as we know, it, w it would you know, you push that button, you can expect the same to happen to yourself in the, in the bilateral U.S.-Russia nuclear deterrence context. context. However, um, it doesn't mean we can't pretend like they don't exist, right? Uh, so, you know, nuclear war wasn't rational in the Cold War either because it did mean mutual suicide. But that didn't mean we didn't take it seriously, right? And so economic interdependence, I don't think, um, makes nuclear weapons any less dangerous or capable, if you know what I mean. I think the Russians have long, just to editorialize myself, the Russians have long had a strong case that when we talk about missile defense systems and so forth, we're expecting them to pretend that our capabilities don't exist. Um, are ir irrelevant to their strategic situation. Uh, I, I, I just suggest that as a mirrored image to what you were saying we should not do or cannot do. Yes, although I think they project future capabilities onto... Onto missile defense, yes. yeah. But I'm just saying that, you know, as, uh, as Ar Ar Arbatov the Younger once said in an IISS conference, we have transform, this was in happier days, we have transformed our political relationship, but our strategic relationship is more or less the same it always was. It's one of mutual assured destruction, and, you know, Russians don't actually forget that. Now, it's also true that there are tens of thousands of people in the uh, U.S. military and political establishment that don't forget it either, right. uh, and have to work on it every day. I mean, we have all strategic command that basically does this for a living. Um, so I think it's more prom it's more prominent in the political leadership's view of the world there because, frankly, of what they see as the potential that well because of U.S. post Cold War interventions in places like and I could give the list but. right. Uh, Jason, yeah, I, I I didn't mean to no, force right. you to. I thought <laughs> I'd seen your hand, but I think it may have been Brian's that was looked like yours. No, that's okay. I didn't want to. Your expectations of the talk, I guess. Please. Uh, quick, just back to the NATO enlargement piece and your, your suggestion. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the political viability here in Washington for uh, coming off a, um, you know, what's very, a very supportive Capitol Hill and so forth for the open door policy. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. and maybe what it would mean for Montenegro and some of the other countries mm. under consideration. So I wasn't referring to the um, Western Balkans uh, in, the, in, in this context. I think I put them to the, to, to the side for a second, including Macedonia, by the way, which is a sort of longstanding absurdity about <laughs> why Macedonia isn't a member of NATO. But um, that's another story entirely. Uh, so a lot of the ideas that I just laid out would be politically dead on arrival in this town right now, or are, I should say. Um, and you saw that in evidence in the Ukrainian Freedom Support Act that was passed by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, offering major non-NATO ally status not only to Ukraine, but also to Moldova and Georgia. Um, the problem, I think, that we face is that the credibility of our principles is not matched by the actions that we're taking on, on the ground. Um, and that, at the end of the day, devalues the principles. Um, so it's become 
politically impossible to talk about the limits here, but we, you know, if you look at the situation on the ground, we see the limits on display in the tragedy that has unfolded over the last nine months in Ukraine. So, uh, political viability, you're asking the right question in the terms of, uh, of why governments aren't talking like this. It is perhaps not politically viable, but that doesn't make it any less strategically uh, important, I think. And, you know, presidents, it should be noted, have the, both the legal authority and the political authority to try to change the conversation and, uh, and, and to change policy, given, given the way our Constitution endows uh, the executive branch with almost exclusive authority over foreign policy. Uh, my name is Evan Sankey. I'm a SICE first year. Uh, you mentioned uh, briefly in your talk uh, the diminished role of Sergei Lavrov. I wonder mm-hmm. if you might elaborate on that. He's sort of traditionally been seen as the the godfather of Russian foreign policy. And I wonder what you think his role is. In so on, on most international crises, um, he's been very, very influential in Russian decision-making. I think this crisis is one that really empowers different actors in Moscow. And although he is the primary sort of face of Russian diplomacy for um, you know, the State Department and, and uh, ministries of foreign affairs in European countries, he is not, his ministry is not the one, you know, involved in eastern Ukraine and those folks don't particularly think that they have to answer to his ministry Um, so in that sense uh, I think um, you know he hasn't he's not uh, central in the in the decision making in Moscow is my guess and uh, I think we've seen to a certain extent how uh, particularly after Geneva in April he came out as soon as he got back to Moscow. There was a he gave this unbelievably um, mm, tendentious interview in English. Two days later, basically blaming the United States for everything. One had to assume had one has to assume based on that that he might have overextended his brief and gotten had his wings clipped as a result. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really make very much sense as to why you would do that so quickly after uh, having just reached an agreement. I saw a couple other hands. I'm going to... Okay, well, in that case, um, we're getting toward... Okay, two more questions. I'm going to close the list after that. We're reaching... Unless anybody else... Okay. So I'll start with you, sir, and then you can My name is Nick Wunder. I'm a SICE grad in the Russia Department, and I now work at the U.S. Department of Energy... National Nuclear Security Administration. For the longest time, American foreign policy has been guided, at least in part, by the concepts of democratic development and human rights. To what extent has this importance of values in the European context been conflated with NATO? I hear time and again that it's about common values, common beliefs, things like that. Is that a positive thing? in American foreign policy? And if it is, how does that help us get on with the Um So it should be said globally, if we look beyond Europe, that uh, the United States is perfectly happy to do business and be even in alliance relationships with governments whose values are far more removed from our own than um, Russia, Saudi Arabia comes to mind. Um, but uh, I think your question is, is does NATO mean democracy, right? Is that the same thing? Um, Historically, that has certainly not been the case. I mean, if you look at Turkey, there have been several military coups um, while, uh, since Turkey has been a member of NATO. Um, And today, if we look at uh, a country like, oh, I don't know, Hungary or Bulgaria, I mean, there's some problems with the uh, democratic credentials of some of our allies these days. Um, But NATO, first and foremost, um, and NATO enlargement, was really about uh, transforming the security sector in post-communist countries. And 
the enlargement process, which had a lot of benchmarking to it, um, and really, you know, gave impetus to do difficult things in a very sensitive area of governance, was pretty effective. Now, um, unfortunately, I think we learned that once you're in, the incentive to actually continue reforming dissipates dramatically. Um, and reform in some of the Central and Eastern European allies uh, has not kept the pace with uh, you know, developments in military affairs more broadly and, and their own security needs. So, um, but NATO was never about uh, first uh, democratizing. It was about democratizing one aspect of, of governance because that's what it does. Um, in its own day-to-day -day operations, namely have democratic control of the armed forces and so on and so forth. So, um, now, if you contrast that with the EU, although there was a lot of regulatory stuff, you know, fisheries don't really have much to do with democracy, I suppose, um, or even customs regulations, uh, or even agricultural subsidies, but... Um, the power of the acquis communautaire as a blunt instrument to um, transform, basically to transplant government governance structures into places where uh, they didn't exist before has been, you know, on a global scale, if we look at transitions from authoritarian rule, pretty amazing in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Last um, yeah, so there have been a lot of questions about a nuclear-related issue, so I figured this was a good time to ask. Um, especially in the context of the Ukraine crisis, um, there's been a lot of uh, negative rhetoric um, about the outlook for additional cooperation, additional START treaties, um, saying that's kind of well, gone, gone down the tubes. And uh, I was just wondering, so five-year outlook, do you think it's possible um, to see a START three, or um, is that kind of lost? Well, I should note that um, the New START Treaty uh, is effectively START III, there was a START II, um, and in fact is referred to in Russian as START III. Um, the question of whether there will be one is sort of hard to predict. Um, clearly, the proposal that has been put on the table by the U.S., I think, uh, makes a whole lot of sense from both countries' perspective. We're talking about a, uh, a cuts that would come at the end of the New START uh, implementation period um, is what's been talked about, and by uh, one third of deployed. Now, it would make uh, the modernization of both countries' arsenals a whole lot more affordable in fiscally challenging times. Um, do I think it's politically likely to happen? No, and we haven't seen any signs that the Russians are actually interested. And this was before the Ukraine crisis began. After all, the um, proposal was basically put on the table in the same month that that uh, joint statement was signed in June 2013, and there were no nibbles um, in the interim uh, before the crisis started. So um, I think uh, our hopes for a quick next round are, um, well, any hopes are probably now uh, in the category of pipe dreams. However, uh, I have and had my doubts about the viability of a another bilateral round um, in the same mold as New Start, uh, even before the political problems and broader collapse of the bilateral relationship that has occurred over the last nine months. Um, mostly because uh, I don't think the Russians are uh, feel that they can go lower. Um, and still meet their requirements. Um, and that has to do with their, uh, the, the fact that the U.S. has leapt ahead in a number of areas that affect strategic stability from their perspective. Missile defense, Dana mentioned, was one of them, uh, but so is prompt global strike, um, conventional prompt global strike, uh, and uh, a number of other areas like uh, cyber and so on. So. Uh, I think there was going to have to be a rethink of whether we could, well, I think there was, uh, the chances for a follow-on to New Start were not great even before the crisis broke out for both, for, for reasons that seemed structural to me. Um, 
Well, that's a happy note to end on. You can say it's not so <laughs> bad because it was bad anyway. So yeah. we'll, uh, well, we have a new start. Yeah. You know, that was a big achievement. That was a big achievement. Okay, I was. I shouldn't really end on a joke because it's a. Um, um, it's a very serious and, and troubling subject, and I think everybody, uh, in a moment, will join me in, in thanking you for a, for an excellent presentation. Uh, but before you do so, just a reminder that in this room, immediately there's a reception, um, modest, um, modest proportions. So please stay for that. But bef before before doing that, please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Sharp for an excellent talk. Thank you.